Yeah, that thing interferes. Okay, so he has a very brief and modest CV. Um, Chris was previously a student and a lecturer at UCT, and for the last almost 20 years, he's been a tutor at, in the Continuing Education Department of Oxford University. His special interests are the history of Napoleonic France and Roman of Russia, on both of which he has previously lectured at the summer school. Please welcome Chris. Am I audible? Yes. Usually what happens is everyone says by day three, now I can hear you. <laughs> well, that's no great help. Are you okay today? Yes. Okay, good. Anyway, welcome. Um, I originally called this lecture Death in Ekaterinburg, uh, but I was told that that might be a little bit obscure, so it's been changed to the last of the Romanovs but it comes to the same thing. And uh, here we have the last Romanov, the last imperial family. Um, as you, from left to right, we've got Olga, Tatiana, and the Tsar and the Tsarina. Uh, Tsar and the Tsarina, and then Maria, and then Anastasia, and the boy, of course, the much longed for and pampered and cosseted air Alexei. And I like starting with this photograph because, of course, to many people, the assassination or the execution of the Tsar sounds like ancient history. And think how much has happened in Russian history since that execution. And yet, it's only just over a hundred years ago um, when I first gave this lecture at the Oxford University Summer School uh, in July last year, uh, I checked on the records and found that there were over 15,000 people in Britain who had been born before the Tsar's death who were still alive. So this is not ancient history. In a way, this is quite modern history. And of course, we're reminded that we're in the age of photography. We're not going back to portraiture or, you know, sort of iconography. You know, these are photographs. And worth mentioning that the Tsar himself, incidentally, was a very keen amateur photographer. And the Romanov family, the life of the Romanov family, is probably better documented than almost any other family in the world. Um, now, I don't know, I'm assuming that most of you will know something about the reasons why the Tsar, or why the Tsar's government fell in March 1917. Uh, and that's really the story, the cause of the Russian Revolution and the whole sequence of events which led up to his abdication. And... Uh, I'm going to um, start this story. I'm going to assume that you know some of those reasons, and it doesn't really matter very much for the purpose of today's talk if you don't. Uh, but I'm going to start with the point on March the 15th, 1917, uh, when Tsar Nicholas II abdicated. And um, this is the first one. And um, uh, incidentally, the dates of Russian history, as you probably know, um, are new style and old style. March the 15th is new style. Uh, that is when, um, that is the Gregorian calendar. Do you all know this? But until 1918, the Russians were still using the Julian calendar. Um, and uh, for reasons too long to go into now, they had not adopted the Gregorian calendar when the rest of Europe operated or, or transferred to the Gregorian calendar. And as a result, they were about 13 days behind the rest of Europe. And when Lenin became leader of Russia, he announced that from the 1st of January 1918, Russia would move on to the new calendar. 
Um, Right, so March the 15th has always been commented on that it, it is the Ides of March, but of course it wasn't the Ides of March in uh, the old Julian calendar. It would have been about February the 26th or thereabouts. Okay, so this is the moment at which the Tsar abdicates. Sorry, one more point. I'm going to show you half a dozen clips from this film, Nicholas and Alexandra, and uh, those of you who attended a course I gave here about 10 years ago may remember other clips from this film. And it's, I've only seen it about 60 times. Um, you know, I can hum all the music, I can repeat all the lines. I think it's an absolutely wonderful film. But the reason that I show it is because it's better than a documentary. It's been very accurately and carefully researched. Um, and um, really no sort of amount of sort of explanation can convey the immediacy of the situation better than this film does. So, clip number one. Those have been arrested. Can we turn the lights, please? Order your troops. Can we march on? At this Peter? moment, Your Majesty. A little bit. If my troops knew the Tsar was here, there's every chance they would turn on you. Whole garrisons are going over. Sire, the Duma also insists on your abdication. Just for the clips, then we turn. Petersburg. Admiral of the Baltic Fleet, Napenin. It is with greatest difficulty I keep my troops and the fleet in check. I urge the Tsar to abdicate. General Ruski cannot answer for my troops. I implore His Majesty to abdicate. His Imperial Highness General Nicholas Nikolaev. What does Nikolaev say? On my knees, I beg you to abdicate and save the dynasty. Right, well... That was how the message was delivered to Nicholas, that he needed to abdicate in order to save the dynasty. And that's a very important point. Uh, let's have a bit more light again when I'm... Um, and that's a very important point because it was assumed that he would abdicate in favor of his 13-year-old or 12-year-old son, as he was at the time, Alexei. And the reason for that was... Would you rather have less light? Less light? You won't go to sleep? <laughs> okay. Um, the, uh, it was assumed that he would abdicate in favor of his 12-year-old son. Thank you very much. Uh, and the reason for that was that, as you probably know, Alexei had hemophilia. Do you all know that story? And... Uh, the story of Alexei's haemophilia was one of the secret of his haemophilia was one of the best kept secrets in modern history. People in Russia knew that he was not well because he often had to be carried at public processions or wheeled in a sort of wheelchair, but they did not know what the matter with him was. Um, and that was a crucial point in this whole story because when Nicholas abdicated, it was assumed that he would abdicate in favor of his 12-year-old son. And people would have been happy to accept that. A 12-year-old could have not ruled except as a constitutional monarch. But instead, Nicholas can't, as it were, admit to the Russian people 
that his son has hemophilia. So he abdicates instead in favor of his younger brother, Michael, who was a ne'er-do-well and in fact had been exiled from Russia for about 10 years for marrying an unsuitable um, lady with a mysterious past. And in fact, he'd only been allowed back into Russia very shortly before the First World, the First World War began. Um, and of course, that was an important point too, because it was only because the Tsar, the, the, the Tsarevich's illness was a secret that no one knew why Rasputin was given access to the royal family. And uh, no one could understand why this grubby, disreputable, uh, so-called monk, you know, had such privileged access to the court and the royal family. And they couldn't tell anyone. And had they been able to tell people, people might have been much more sympathetic, you know, to the plight of the Tsarina. But without that knowledge, of course, they simply thought that she had become, um, as it were, hoodwinked by a sort of cult-type figure. So this is all a very important part of the background to the story. Now, when the Tsar abdicates, incidentally, I like being interrupted, so anyone who wants to ask a question, please just indicate, and uh, I'm very happy to stop there and then. I will leave time at the end to ask questions, but uh, if you want to, if one occurs to you in, the mid, in mid flow, then please say so. Right. Well, the events which led to Nicholas's abdication were totally unplanned, and no one had given any thought to what would happen after his abdication, and no one had given any thought to what would happen to the imperial family after the abdication. Um, and that was because the uh, February Revolution, as we call it, or the March Revolution, depending on which calendar you're using, was totally spontaneous. It hadn't been planned, it hadn't been sort of uh, uh, pre-organized in any way. It was a spontaneous outbreak. And so, now that the Tsar's abdicated, the job of running the country falls, for want of a better alternative, to what was called a provisional government. And it was supposed to be provisional, and it was called provisional, until general elections for a permanent government could be held. So what gave it the right to claim to be the provisional government? And the answer to that was that it had been appointed by the Duma, or the parliament, the Russian word for parliament, which had been elected in 1916. Now that sounds quite in order and quite legitimate until you remember that only the wealthiest 2% of the population were qualified to vote. So that effectively meant that the Duma was the voice of the great landowners. And that was the case with the Duma that appointed the provisional government. Um, and here we have the members of the first provisional government. And as you can see, they don't exactly look like hot-headed revolutionaries. Um, these are well-established, prosperous, um, very often kind of uh, long-established figures in Russian history. The only one that's of any importance is the one on the back right of the picture, and that is Alexander Kerensky. And Alexander Kerensky becomes the most important figure in the provisional government, and eventually he takes over the provisional government. In fact, he is the last uh, sort of ruler of Russia before the Bolshevik Revolution. And uh, interestingly, he was uh, 37 years old at the time. He was uh, trained as a lawyer. He came from the same small central Russian town that Lenin came from. And in fact, uh, Kerensky's father had been Lenin's headmaster uh, in this little school. Quite extraordinary that these two people should have come from the same town. Um, but Kerensky had established a reputation as a sort of uh, 
demagogue of a, of, of a kind. And as a result, one result of the uh, fact that the provisional government was elected by this very uh, restricted Duma was that an alternative source of authority springs up in opposition to the provisional government and which calls itself the Petrograd Soviet. And the word Soviet, as you probably know, just means a committee. And uh, that claimed to represent the working people of Petrograd. In other words, not the landowners, but the working people of Petrograd. And uh, Petrograd, incidentally, was the name that St. Petersburg had been given at the beginning of the war in order to avoid too Germanic a sound. Um, and so over the next six months, the provisional government and the Petrograd Soviet operate side by side in a sort of competitive and hostile relationship. And the only person who was a member of both bodies was Kerensky. So he is an important figure here, an important link between the masses and the elite. So the fate of the provisional of the imperial family now falls into the hands of the provisional government. And the provisional government have no idea what to do with them. Um, they were an unwanted embarrassment, to be honest. And the landowners who made up the provisional government had no inclination to kill the imperial family. But, of course, the problem was that if they're left alive, they inevitably become a focus for counter-revolution. Is that, that clear? And so, there's a great dilemma. How do we handle this dangerous cargo? Now, the Tsar himself believed that he would be allowed to go into exile abroad or to retire, this was his favorite option, to the Crimea. And there was another possibility, and that was that the imperial family might be granted asylum by his first cousin, good friend, and look-alike, King George V. And uh, King George V of England, Britain, actually issued an invitation of sorts to the royal family at one stage. And here they are, um, about uh, 15 years before the war. Um, I mean, very often you have to explain, you know, it's the Tsar on the left, the king on the right. And they were both the uh, sons of sisters. Both their mothers were princesses of Denmark. And so it's no great surprise that they look very similar to each other. Um, however, once the king had issued the invitation, it was made clear to George that cousin Nicholas might not be welcomed by the British public. He had been an autocratic tyrant, and this war was allegedly being fought to save democracy. And there were supposedly strong currents of republicanism flowing through Britain. It was possible, George was told, that he might even suffer the same fate as cousin Nicholas. So the offer was quietly dropped, never to be renewed. And that was really uh, the imperial family's last chance of a sort of safe exit from Russia. So for the moment, the provisional government dithers. They placed the imperial family under house arrest in the home that they've lived in for the previous 17 years, the Alexander Palace. Now, many of you have been to St. Petersburg, I know, and you will probably have seen the Alexander Palace, which is a marvelous palace, so-called because it was built for Catherine the Great's favorite grandson, who became Tsar Alexander I but they were not allowed to leave the palace grounds and their guards called them Herr and Frau Romanov. In other words, making quite clear that the guards regarded them as having Russian sympathies. And of course, the Tsarina was always known as the German woman in Russia, which was rather uh, unfortunate in a way. I mean, she had been brought up in Germany in Darmstadt, uh, 
but actually, uh, she'd spent far more time at the court of her grandmother, Queen Victoria, and in fact, in attitudes and mentality, she was very much English, but she was still labelled as the German woman. Um, and here we have a couple of photographs of the imperial family in captivity, or not captivity, but house arrest, uh, in the Alexander Palace. Um, and there's the Tsar, and uh, here's the royal f here are the children. And uh, I mean, basically, uh, these, uh, this family is cooped up in the grounds. They're very extensive grounds, and they've got a park and a lake and so on. Um, but it was still um, a pretty trying situation for them. However, in the summer of 1917, everyone's sort of clear about the time scale. In other words, three months after the abdication, uh, the war against Germany, of course, was still in full swing. We're only talking about now June 1917. The war still got another 18 months to run. And uh, the, in June, the provisional government attempted an offensive of its own against the Germans. And the reason for that was that they thought, OK, well, the war has been very unsuccessful so far, but that was because the troops didn't really want to fight for the Tsar. But that'll be quite different now we're in charge. They'll fight enthusiastically for us. And of course, uh, it didn't matter what their enthusiasm was, and it wasn't very enthusiastic, but of course, if you're facing a superior battery of machine guns, it doesn't matter how enthusiastic you are. Um, and. Uh, this offensive was beaten back decisively. And the Germans took Riga, and they threatened Petrograd, and the Tsar himself was in danger of becoming a political pawn. And you can see on this, on this map here um, the, uh, the, the sort of double yellow line in the middle. Can you all see what I'm talking about? Um, that was more or less... Um, where the uh, war, where the front was at the time when the Tsar abdicated. So at this point, Petrograd is still uh, in Russian hands, but it's very close to the front, um, and uh, there's a danger that, of course, the front will be further extended, and eventually you can see from the red line that um, six months later or nine months later, it actually does advance considerably. So they decide to send the Tsar and the family out of harm's way to Tobolsk. And Tobolsk is the second oldest town in Siberia and was at one time its capital. Now, why do they send them to Tobolsk? Can we have a clip? The, the next one. There's a slight problem with coordinating the exact point of the clips because... 
Kaminsky. You will be under his command until you leave the country. His orders carry my authority at all times. Nicholas, I want my things. I want my pictures and my scrapbooks. I want... Frau Romano, you have kept your head. You should be grateful. Come down. No. Vladimir, one goodbye with another, please. break, get lost, one buys and sells them. PowerPoint. He's a bit like the old retainer in the cherry orchard. I don't know if you've seen the film but, or have seen the play, but there's a very similar character in the cherry orchard. Um, anyway, why Tobolsk? Well, Tobolsk was certainly out of harm's way, about 2,000 miles out of harm's way, in fact, 2,000 miles east of Petrograd and about 700 miles east of the Urals. And uh, Tobolsk has a long history, there it is on the map, um, and uh, it had a long history of hosting political prisoners, and many of the 19th century aristocratic conspirators, the so-called Decembrists, had been confined there, and Dostoevsky had been imprisoned there for the first six months of his four-year sentence. He was imprisoned not for political protest, but for debt, as you may know. Um, and he was imprisoned there for the first six months, uh, something of which today Tobolsk is very proud, and there are plenty of statues commemorating his involuntary stay in the town. Um, and uh, we went to Tobolsk uh, eight, about 15 months ago when we went on a sort of trans-Siberian trip, um, and Tobolsk certainly is, you know, at the end of the line. Um, although, of course, as you can see, the line goes on for another, you know, two and a half thousand miles. But it's a long, long, long way, you know, from anywhere where they would have known before. The Tsar's family, for instance, had traveled, had hardly traveled at all. The Tsar had only once been to Siberia in his 25 years as Tsar. So they certainly weren't flying the flag around the country in the way that you'd expect them to. Um, and the imperial family arrived in Tobolsk on the 19th of August, uh, so in other words more or less at the end of the summer, and they moved into the only house in the town which was thought to be fit for their use, which was the home of the governor, or the house of the governor. And here it is, uh, and when we went there uh, in September 2017, it was supposed to be all ready as a sort of showpiece for the centenary of the Romanovs' imprisonment there. But as is often the case, it was delayed by six months or so, and they let us into the front door, and that was about as far as, as we were allowed to go. I mean, it's a handsome house, and they only lived on the top floor of it. Um, and uh, um, uh, they were uh, a, a yard, a sort of yeah, a kind of garden, if you like, was created by fencing off the street in front of the house, and that gave them a sort of leisure area, if you like. But uh, it was pretty confined, no doubt about it. But it wasn't exactly torture. They had a suite of 38 servants and courtiers. They'd been allowed to bring many of their most treasured possessions with them, even if not their photographs or whatever Alexandra was complaining about. And they'd even brought 4,000 bottles of vintage wines from the imperial cellars. So this is not torture. They had the service of at least two priests, and on occasion, they were allowed to attend mass 
in the local church. And the officer in charge of them, Colonel Kobylinski, whom we saw there, we'll see again in a minute, was a gentle, educated man who became quite attached to his charges. And it's often been said that in their time in Tobolsk, the imperial family came as close as they ever did to leading normal lives. And this next little clip is designed to show that. The reason we don't get straight on to this is because when I check these, these, um, the point on the film at which we get it, I'm, I'm obviously using a different program, so we're not exactly. I never celebrated Easter with real eggs before. And when they dry, you rub them with bacon fat to make them shine. I want to do the next one. I used to dread Easter. I had to kiss a whole court three times. 1,600 people. <laughs> they used to line up to be kissed. It put you off kissing. <laughs> Christ has risen. Christ has risen. Christ has risen. They started to dance. Well, can we see? Please. Come on, let's. Open the door. I look so happy. Oh, let's go out of them. I don't think we should. Oh, please, please, let's. Please, go on, please. <laughs> Did you all pick up that lovely line at the start where she says, I've never celebrated Easter with real eggs before. Uh, what she's used to, of course, are Fabergé eggs, um, you know, which, of course, cost 20 million e a piece nowadays if they're ever available. Um, but, uh, as I said, I mean, in, <coughs> in some ways, I mean, this was the nearest they ever got to a normal life, their time in Tobolsk. But what has happened to the Romanovs is a very strange and unexpected occurrence, and that is that 2,000 miles further west in Petrograd, the provisional government has been overthrown by a second revolution, and Russia has passed into the hands of an extreme Marxist group known as the Bolsheviks, which just means the majority. And unlike the first revolution, which resulted in the Tsar's abdication, the Bolsheviks have been planning their program for many years. And they'd thought of almost everything except what to do with the imperial family. And so, for the time being, for another five months, in fact, the imperial family stay on in Tobolsk in a place chosen by and in the charge of a man who'd been appointed by a government which no longer exists. Can you all see the anomaly here? And it's a strange and illogical situation. And uh, once again, the film sort of explains it. 2.21.08. Um, no, the next one. Hang on. 221. 221.08. 
I make suggestions. They go and vote. Tomorrow they could vote to hang me. It's absurd. Dirty boys. They were once, but they're lonely now. Cold and scared to death. Have you got any money? Not much. Why? See, you cross your mind that I represent a non-existent government. Who put me in this post? Who gave me the authority? Whose money pays the troops? Kerensky's gone. The money's gone. I haven't paid them in a month. You think I should pay them? Prisoners keep the guard. I wish I'd had you for my finance minister. You would have revolutionized the penal system. Don't laugh. Shall I take the collection? In Tobolsk, there are rumors of a civil war. God only knows what's going on. I'm here, exposed like this. That's not to keep you in here. It's to keep them out. Them? Who are you expecting? I don't know. I hate this damned assignment. I can't answer for your safety. I can't do my job. You care what happens to us, don't you? It's my job to. What was that about? Apparently there's a civil war. I'm not surprised. Too many people have had too much to lose. He's worried. <sighs> we all are. The Tsar loved sawing logs. And that, that's what this little reference is. You know, the Kaiser said of the Tsar that he's fit only to live in a country house and grow turnips. And, uh, I mean, that was an unkind comment, but it was not totally untrue. And the Tsar loved physical exercise. He was always a very active, um, very energetic person physically, although totally dithery mentally. Um, and uh, that's a nice little illustration of one of his sort of preoccupations. Now, what brings this period to an end, this period of captivity under a government that no longer exists? What brings it to an end is that all the different groups who opposed the Bolsheviks now resorted, sort of in a kind of uncoordinated way, to armed opposition, which eventually became sort of, which escalated into what we call the Russian Civil War. And for a time, one of the most successful leaders was Admiral Kolchak, who advanced from Vladivostok on the Pacific coast and started pushing into Western Siberia. And by the spring of 1918, it seemed that he might, here we'll hear you have another, um, sawing log photograph, this time with his son. Um, and you can see, incidentally, that uh, Alexei's grown, you know, he's now 13 years old, and he's almost as tall as his father already. Uh, not that that was very tall. Nicholas was about five foot six. Um, but Admiral Kolchak has pushing into Western Siberia, and it seems that he might have get far enough to liberate the imperial family which would have been a massive propaganda coup, if nothing more. And here you see um, the, you know, the approximate sort of situation on the front. Can you see Vladivostok on the Pacific coast here? And uh, Admiral Kolchak is advancing up the Trans-Siberian Railroad, and he's not far from, uh, well, Omsk is about, or Tobolsk is halfway between Omsk and the Katerinburg, and that's where he's got to at that stage. And as a result, the Bolsheviks, who by now have uh, relocated the government back to the ancient capital of Moscow, and the reason, incidentally, that they take the capital back to Moscow is not for any kind of reasons of historic appropriateness, but because the Germans are too close to Leningrad or to Petrograd for comfort, and they feel that the government would be more secure in Moscow, so they move it to Moscow. Um, and they decide that the Tsar needs to be moved to a safer haven. 
and a so-called extraordinary commissioner was sent by the Central Committee to escort the Tsar back to Moscow. And what was going to happen to him there was that Trotsky wanted to put him on public trial, as had happened to Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. And he wanted to really make a showpiece, a showpiece of a trial of the Tsar and his family. However, this is where the story begins to get a bit murky. Now, there was a Bolshevik-controlled Soviet in every major town in Russia, and one of the most ruthless and militant was the Ekaterinburg Soviet. You can see Ekaterinburg there. And they demanded that the Tsar be brought to Ekaterinburg. And after urgent consultations with Moscow, the commissioner was ordered to hand over the prisoners to Ekaterinburg. Um, and you, there you see Omsk, Tumen, Tobolsk. Can you see them? Um, okay. Uh, so that's how close they've got, and that's really where they're trying to uh, secure. Uh, I mean, that, that's too close for comfort, so they've got to move him further west. And the train from Tobolsk to Moscow would normally have passed through Ekaterinburg anyway. So there was perhaps the danger that the local Bolsheviks might take the law into their own hands. And perhaps the, lo the loyalty of the local Soviet was thought to be crucial in the forthcoming battle against Kolchak. Or perhaps it was the role played by the head of the Ekaterinburg Soviet, a man called Philip Goloschekin, who was a close friend of the Bolshevik enforcer, Yakov Sverdlov. Does that name ring a bell? One of Lenin's closest associates. And Goloschekin had acquired the nickname the Eye of the Kremlin uh, in March 1918, and again in June, Goloschekin went to Moscow to discuss the fate of the Romanovs with Lenin and Sverdlov. So, this is very much a sort of uh, running issue at the time. And the outcome was that on the 20th of April, Nicholas and Alexandra and their second daughter, Maria, were transferred from Tobolsk to Ekaterinburg. And the reason that only Maria goes and the other four children are left behind is that at least two of them were not well enough to travel. And so it was thought uh, that they should join the family later. And the first stage of the journey was what was known uh, from, in other words, from Tobolsk to Ekaterinburg, was by road, and this is now known in Russia as the Golgotha Road, and uh, extraordinarily, it went directly past the former home of Rasputin. And uh, this is actually, uh, I put here Rasputin's home, Pokrovsko. It was identical to this. This is not actually his home. This is his parents' home. He had a home immediately in front of this. Uh, and his home was demolished in 1974 at the same time as the Ipatiev house was demolished. Uh, we'll come back to that later, to prevent either of them from becoming neo-imperialist shrines. So they go past the house of their former, you know, sort of confidant and support. Alexandra writes in the diary, which she keeps every day, she writes, at about noon, got to Pokrovsko, stood long before our friend's house, saw his friends and family looking out of the window at us. And of course, Rasputin himself had been murdered 18 months previously. Uh, and if you go to that house today, there's a little plaque outside the house marking the spot where the imperial family paused for 20 minutes on their journey you know, back to Ekaterinburg. And when you go there, I mean, nothing could be more remote than Pokrovsko. I mean, the whole of Siberia you know, is like the end of the world, but Pokrovsko, I mean, a tiny little sort of place of wooden houses and mud roads and so on, and it's astonishing to think that somebody who really altered the fate of the whole world in the 20th century could have come from anywhere as remote as that. 
And on the 20th of April, they reached Ekaterinburg. And Goloschekin was so nervous that the imperial family might be lynched by the very extremist Ekaterinburg mob that he had the train sent on to the freight terminal on the eastern edge of the town. And from there, they were taken into the town center to a house which had been re uh, requisitioned from a retired engineer named Nikolai Ipatiev. And uh, this is the Ipatiev house, uh, as it once was. Um, and uh, here is another view of it, um, obviously sometime later. Uh, and this was where the royal family, the imperial family, were incarcerated for their last imprisonment. This house is known in history now as the Ipatiev House, but the Bolsheviks named it the House of Special Purpose. But they didn't tell anyone what that special purpose was. And they immediately surrounded the house with a high wooden fence, which made it clear that it had become a prison, and the windows of the upper floor were painted over with whitewash to prevent the family from being able to see out or prevent anyone from being able to see them inside. And the imperial family remained there for 78 days. And the conditions of their imprisonment deteriorate little by little over that period. And at first, when they arrived there, procedures had been rather lax uh, under a rather alcoholic sort of um, custodian. But on the 4th of July, a new commandant takes charge, Yakov Yurovsky, who gave the impression of being more humane and Nicholas, getting things wrong as he always did, immediately took to Yurovsky. Uh, but, uh, and, Yurov and for instance, uh, somebody recorded that Yurovsky, when he came in, sat down next to Alexei, that's the Tsar, the Tsarevich, and asked solicitously after his health. That made a good impression. However, appearances were deceptive. Yakov Yurovsky was the son of a Jewish glazier, a lifelong Bolshevik, Alexei's, Alexei's future executioner, and in fact, a fervent anti-monarchist. And of course, everyone has commented on the irony that the fate of the imperial family was eventually going to be decided by the son of a Jewish glazier from a country town in Russia. And from their diaries, it's obvious that the chief enemy of the Romanovs was not fear, but boredom. And at first, they had some, brief, some pleasure from brief snatches of conversation with the more sympathetic of the guards, but eventually even that was disallowed by Yurovsky. And Lenin and the Bolsheviks have their own reasons for delaying the decision on the Romanovs. And that was that in March 1918, they'd signed a peace treaty with the Germans, the Peace of Brest-Litovsk, which uh, had left the Germans in control of vast areas of Western Russia. It included, for instance, the payment of heavy war fines. And at one stage, there'd been, even been a clause in this peace treaty specifying that the imperial family should be handed over to the Germans unharmed. And uh, why the Germans wanted them is not clear, but of course, uh, both Nicholas and Alexandra were cousins of the Kaisers from different branches of the family. Um, but uh, it was never carried out. This clause was dropped. But the Bolsheviks do not want to aggravate their relationship with the Germans by executing, you know, two of the Tsar of the Kaiser's cousins. That makes obvious sense. And in fact, the Bolsheviks continue to toy with the idea of using the imperial family as bargaining chips to get improved terms from the Germans. And that situation is uh, still in um, operation you know, right until um, the, the execution of the family. 
However, by July 1918, the military situation in Ekaterinburg has deteriorated significantly. Kolchak is advancing from the, from the east, and in the south and the west, an army of 25,000 Czech deserters. Do you know about this? The Czech Legion, um, they have reached the city outskirts. And why there were 25,000 Czech deserters roaming around the center of Russia is because these people had, uh, as it were, cast themselves off from their Austro-Hungarian masters because they wanted freedom from the Austro-Hungarians and they thought their best bet would be by joining the Russians and fighting against the Austro-Hungarians only to find that as soon as they got to Russia, Russia and Germany declared peace. So that wasn't a very well-timed move. Um, so uh, they now, it now seemed that the Bolsheviks could not prevent the Tsar from falling into <coughs> enemy hands. So at 1.30 a.m. on the 17th of July, Urofsky woke the family doctor and told him that enemy troops were closing in and for their own safety, the imperial family should now go down to the basement of the Patiev house. The family took about 45 minutes to dress and to get ready to move. And why they're taking so long to dress, incidentally, is because the clothes that they're dressed in are not just ordinary clothes. These are uh, costumes which are padded with diamonds and precious stones and so on, which they think are going to provide for their future once they get out of Russia. And when Nicholas hears this news, this order, uh, and remember this is 1.30 in the morning, he said to his family, at least you are getting out of here. And uh, that always reminds me a bit of the last line of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Do you remember that? Where uh, they're about to burst out of their hiding place into a hail of bullets and Butch says, for a moment there I thought we were in trouble. Do you remember? <laughs> and uh, this is very similar to Nicholas's reaction. And uh, they were led outdoors and down another flight of stairs into a basement. And this is a room 16 feet by 12, lit by a single low wattage light bulb. And there they kept waiting for another 40 minutes while a disposal truck maneuvers into place. And it was ordered to rev its engines to mask the sound of the shootings. And Urofsky then enters the room Follows, followed by eight fellow executioners. And uh, the idea was that there should be one executioner for every member of the family. And with them, incidentally, uh, is the doctor, uh, a lady's maid, um, uh, another valet, and a, sh a chef. So in other words, there are 11 of them all together. Um, anyway, this, this clip... Um, shows this scene, 
Anything here, please? What, what happened, in fact, was, I mean, it's, you know, that's true to the spirit of it, but not exactly to the detail, that when Yurovsky comes in with his posse, he actually read out a sentence of death uh, where, uh, justifying what he was about to do. And when he finishes that, then the posse opens fire. And uh, in theory, each one of them had a specific victim to polish off, but they botch their job so badly, the execution squad, uh, partly because many of them were blind drunk already, um, that it actually took about 20 minutes to kill them all. And the smoke from the gunfire in this very small room made precision impossible. And many of the victims had so many jewels sewn into their clothing that instead of penetrating, the bullets ricocheted around the room. And some of the executioners ran out of bullets and had to finish the job with bayonets instead. And it was this very small room, which uh, has some 11, uh, 20 people in it, um, firing guns at point-blank range, pistols, all of them, incidentally, very old-fashioned pistols. Um, I mean, it was a scene of indescribable chaos. And uh, uh, every imaginable bodily fluid, you know, sort of pouring out of, on all sides. And finally, the slaughter comes to an end. And even when they've finished, they realize that one of the girls has not actually died and she has to be polished off with a bullet to the head. Um, and. Uh, Finally, the bodies are loaded onto the truck and disposed of in a disused mine shaft about 10 miles away from Ekaterinburg. Uh, 
And incidentally, um, that is the last picture taken of the Tsar's family in the Apatiev house. And there they are sunning themselves. It's mid-June, or mid-July rather, uh, on the roof of the house, um, which is the only part they're allowed to go out onto. It was recorded by, first of all, by nearly all the executioners, who later became sort of celebrities and toured the country, uh, giving sort of lecture recitals on how they'd uh, carried out this. And then, of course, um, there was also an inquiry, which I'll come back to in a minute, which recorded all the available evidence. So we know pretty well that this is more or less what happened. Um, Well, the shootings of the daughters, I'm coming back to that in a minute, but what Lenin said was he did not want any family members to be left alive as a living banner, as he put it, you know, under which counter-revolution, you know, could mobilize. But it was a very unpopular measure, shooting the, shooting the children. And in fact, the Bolsheviks tried to keep the whole thing a secret for as long as possible because they know that public opinion will be revolted by the murder of these innocent children. What happened to the children? Well, very good question. Um, very good question. Yurovsky, uh, whatever his failings, was scrupulously honest. And he, uh, of course, many of the execution squad tried to make off with the jewellery, but he actually forced them to... Uh, hand it all over and they put it in great piles and they collected it in baskets and they took it back to the Central Committee in Moscow. Uh, so that's theory, what happened to the jury. I mean, obviously, I'm, I suspect a piece or two got away, but that was what happened to the most of it. Um, but they're taken to this disused mine shaft, as I said, about... Um, 15 miles uh, west of, sorry, east of Katerinburg. Uh, and uh, the Ganina Yama, that's the mine of the two brothers. Um, and uh, this mine shaft, uh, now it looks sort of green and, you know, it's grown over with vegetation. But in those days, it was just an open cast mine. And the plan was to put them down the mine shaft and to collapse the mine over their bodies by dynamiting the mine shaft. And that was how they hoped to conceal the whereabouts of the bodies. But the mine shaft had been so well made that the dynamite had no effect on the mine shaft at all. And so after the explosions and the detonation, you could still see the bodies at the bottom of the mine shaft. And so in the end, the bodies had to be fished out again and they had to find another place to bury them. And they actually bury them in a sort of shallow grave about 60 meters away from this mine shaft. Um, and although this was, that had not been a place that had been sort of pre-prepared or anything, it did take uh, about 60 years before, that, before their bodies were found. Um, so whatever you think about the Romanovs, uh, and I'm actually not one of those who sentimentalizes about their fate. I mean, this was a truly ghastly episode. And in one respect, the Bolshevik calculations had been correct. And that was that nine days after the killings, the White Armies re-entered Ekaterinburg and they take control of the town. And Admiral Kolchak once they have uh, recaptured the town, Admiral Kolchak commissions a Russian civil servant called Nikolai Sokolov to conduct a formal inquiry into the disappearance of the imperial family. And Sokolov did his work very thoroughly. And most of what we know today uh, is the result of the evidence that he unearthed in the eight months before Ekaterinburg was recaptured by the Bolsheviks. And uh, here's a rather strange photograph of Sokolov investigating the mine shaft. You see, he's gone down to the bottom of the shaft, 
uh, to see what, um, how easy it would have been to have concealed bodies at the bottom of the mine shaft. But the question I've posed is whether this should be classified as an assassination or an execution. Now, we don't talk about the assassination of Charles I or Louis XVI because no matter how biased and predetermined the verdict was, both of them at least had the formality of a trial. And as I said, that was what Trotsky hoped to orchestrate for Tsar Nicholas. But conversely, deaths on the battlefield today are often described as executions. And in the Middle East, after a kangaroo court, jihadis have beheaded their, ex their victims, claiming that they're carrying out executions. So the dividing line between an execution and an assassination is quite an arbitrary one. But if the deaths of the imperial family had been decided by the central government after some kind of considered deliberation, I would be inclined to call it an execution. If, on the other hand, it was carried out by a rogue group who'd forced the hand of the central government and taken the law into their own hands, then I would think that would be closer to an assassination. So the question of central government involvement is crucial to this question. And curiously enough, it even has a practical implication today, and that is that if it can be proved that the Romanovs suffered because of state action, then even today under Russian law, their descendants are eligible for some sort of compensation. Strange, but true. If, on the other hand, it's a private action, then they're not eligible for compensation. So obviously, if we could discover some document bearing Lenin's signature, which authorized the death sentence, then one area of uncertainty would be removed. But in the same way, as Hitler took great pains to ensure that no written evidence could link him with the Holocaust, so Lenin ensured that no written evidence could link him with the deaths of the imperial family. And of course, that by no means absolves him of any responsibility or any connection with the decision, knowing what we know of Lenin, who was one of history's all-time control freaks, it's impossible to believe that a decision of that importance could have been carried out without his approval. Now, Lenin's view on monarchy in general and on the Romanovs in particular were no secret. Lenin's elder brother, Alexander, had actually been hanged in 1887 for his involvement in a plot against Tsar Alexander III. And Lenin always referred to Tsar Nicholas as the most evil enemy of the Russian people, a bloody executioner, a crowned robber, battening on what he'd looted from the Russian peasants and workers. And the fate of the Romanovs was not high on the list of Lenin's priorities when he seized power. But we know that it was discussed in the Central Committee as early as November 1917. And remember that they only seized power in what was then October. Uh, so in other words, in the first fortnight of taking power, they discussed the question of what to do with the Romanovs. In January 1918, the Central Committee discussed Trotsky's pet project of bringing Nicholas to Petrograd for trial. Do you remember they're still in Tobolsk at that stage? And in February, the subject was raised again with, with a more open-ended verdict on where such a trial might take place. So in other words, the matter, all I'm point, trying to point out is that the matter has been discussed not once but many times in Central Committee, so don't let anyone pretend that the Bolshevik Central Committee had no knowledge of what was happening to the, Bol to the Ro uh, Romanovs. In March, uh, the Tobolsk Soviet had telegraphed Lenin about the lax security 
surrounding the imperial family. And in April, the Central Committee, remember, passed a resolution transferring the Romanovs to the Urals. And for international consumption, the official line was that en route to Moscow, they'd been kidnapped by a militant Bolshevik group based in Ekaterinburg. However, telegraphic evidence conclusively proves that Lenin's hatchet man, Sverdlov, unambiguously ordered the Romanovs to be taken to Ekaterinburg. And there are Lenin and Sverdlov in the same uh, Sverdlov on the right of Lenin in that picture. Uh, Sverdlov was also um, a Jewish intellectual uh, who had become very close to Lenin. And in fact, as a result of this action, Ekaterinburg was renamed Sverdlov. And uh, it remained uh, under that name, in fact, until 1990, when it was renamed Ekaterinburg. Um, and a month later, Sverdlov stated that the government had information about various plots being hatched to liberate the imperial family. Now, that was true. There were dozens of plots, um, but none of them had a remote chance of success. So it wasn't a real threat, but it was one that you could blow up as a reason for taking firmer action. And Sverdlov urges his colleagues on the Central Committee into action uh, before they are preempted by other forces. And in July 2018, Sverdlov's man in the Urals, that's Golosh Chekin, you remember we mentioned him earlier, comes to Moscow to ask for a final decision about the Tsar. And at one point, Lenin had insisted, as this is the point I was making earlier, that no living banner, as he put it, should survive as a rallying point for monarchists. Uh, so, uh, when they talk about the execution of the Tsar, effectively they're talking about the execution of the whole family. And on the other hand, the Bolsheviks knew that the murder of the children would provoke an international outrage, and so it should be kept secret for as long as possible. So, the result of all that is that it's absurd to suggest that Lenin and the Central Committee were too preoccupied with other matters to know what was happening to the Tsar. Um, now, Sverdlov's warning about the Ural's Soviet wasn't totally a matter of scaremongering. The Ural Soviet was definitely one of the most militant bodies in the country. And when the imperial family were moved for the last time, Nicholas said, I'll go anywhere at all, only not to the Ural. And the Katerinburg was a former mining town which had become an industrial heavyweight. It had a large working class population which was vulnerable to shifts in economic trends. Its status as a hub on the Trans-Siberian Railway encouraged thousands of agitators to pour into the town after the November Revolution. And these people are intolerant of any attempt to delay Nicholas's fate. Why are you fussing over Nicholas? It's time to be done with him, they shout. Others say, if you don't annihilate Nicholas the bloody, we'll do it for you. So there is very violent anti-monarchist sentiment in Ekaterinburg. And the Ural Soviet felt sufficiently pressurized to demand that the Central Committee make a decision as soon as possible. And Sverdlov's lapdog, uh, lap Golos Chekin, he arrives in Moscow on July the 3rd and to press the case, and there are only seven members of the Central Committee in Moscow at the time, but among those three, among those are the three key players, Lenin, Sverdlov, and Jasinski. Jasinski was the head of the secret police. Felix Jasinski. And when Golos Chekin returns to Ekaterinburg on the 10th of July, he brings with him the reassurance that Moscow had agreed in principle to the execution of the Romanovs. It was just a matter of waiting for a signal as to exactly when. And the local Soviet now start reconnoitering possible sites for the disposal and the concealment of the bodies, 
and that's where they get to the mine at Ganina Yama. Um, but the most urgent news was from the military commanders saying that they can't hold out against the approaching Czech army for much longer and the Katerinburg has a matter of days at the most to remain in Bolshevik hands. On the 16th of July, it was agreed that the execution can't be put off any longer. And when the nuns from the nearby convent came, as they did every day, with their daily offering of milk and eggs for the royal family, they were told that after that, you don't need to come again. And a little kitchen boy, who had been Alexei's playmate, was sent away, allegedly because his uncle needed him. Uh, and Alexandra noted in her diary, I wonder whether we will ever see him again. And on the 16th of July, she makes her last entry in the diary, and that was 15 degrees to bed. And Yurovsky decides that the best place for the execution would be the cellar, uh, where the noise of the shootings would be muffled, and he hands out pistols to 11 of his men one for each of the victims, but three of his men then refuse the assignment. They refuse to kill the imperial children. What harm had these children done to anyone? They demand. And so in the end, the hit squad was reduced to eight. And uh, Moscow was then contacted for the final go ahead. However, the telegraph, the the telegraph lines were down, as they so often were during the Civil War, so the telegram had to be sent via Petrograd instead, um, and it was only received in Moscow three hours later, and a reply could not have reached to Katerinburg until 12.30 local time, but uh, having said that, there's no record that Moscow ever sent a telegram, a telegram authorizing or let's say, giving the go-ahead to the executioners. So can you see the point of all this? That it remains slightly murky whether, in fact, the local Soviet took it into their own hands or whether the Central Committee actually authorised the killing. So whatever the truth, this muddle has always given Moscow the excuse that this vital decision was taken out of its hands. And one might well ask, you know, whether it matters one way or another, but for the purpose of today's lecture, if the Ural Soviet gave the order, it would have been closer to an assassination. And if the Bolshevik Central Committee gave the order, it would have been closer to an execution. And that difference was accentuated when the British consul in Ekaterinburg, and it's interesting to note that there was a British consul in Ekaterinburg, telegraphed the Foreign Secretary later that morning saying, the Tsar Nicholas II was shot last night, whereupon a Bolshevik post office official snatched it out of his hands and rewrote, the hangman Tsar Nicholas was shot last night, a fate he richly deserved. The British consul had no option but to send the altered message. So that describes your point of view. One way it would be an execution, the other way it would be an assassination. For the next 75 years, in other words, the time of communist government in Russia, um, the death of the Romanovs was applauded as a noble and necessary act. And the executioners toured the country, giving often highly exaggerated accounts of the event to school children and young pioneers. And eventually, in 1974, on the orders of the Ekaterinburg governate, then led by a rising star named Boris Yeltsin, the Patiev House and the Rasputin House were both demolished to avoid their becoming neo-imperialist shrines. Um, and in 1979, five years later, what were thought to be Nicholas's, Nicholas II's remains um, were at last uncovered 60 metres from the mine shaft, along with four other suspected uh, Romanov relatives. And the forensic quest 
to identify the remains during the 1990s drew international attention. And Peter Gill, a British scientist, used DNA profiling. And now, of course, we're so used to DNA profiling, it's become almost sort of taken for granted. But this was almost one of the first cases where it was ever used. And I remember very well attending a lecture at Oxford University where Peter Gill and one of his associates uh, explained how they had identified these bones as being indisputably those of the Romanovs. Because the DNA mitochondrial testing, do you all know, I'm sure you know much more about it than I do. Um, you know, they had established by connecting it with Prince Philip, you know, the Duke of Edinburgh's uh, mitochondrial DNA, because he was also a uh, descended on, on, from the female line in the same way. And they proved that his mitochondrial DNA and the bones of these five victims were absolutely identical. And that was how they proved that these were the Romanov family. Um, and uh, uh, the mitochondrial DNA from um, several other royal, European royals um, was uh, you know, perfectly matched the samples taken from these five and the bodies found were indeed declared to be those of the last Romanovs but of course there are only five of them so what became of the other two? Well 15 years later two additional sets of remains were uncovered and they've now been identified positively as belonging to Alexei and to Maria. You probably know this story quite well. But the collapse of, the, of communism in 1990 totally altered the official attitude to the imperial family, as you may know. And with astonishing speed, after the fall of the Soviet Union, Christianity and Tsar worship returned to Russia. And a large cathedral was built on the site of the Apatiev House. And that is the cathedral. Uh, in fact, when we went to Ekaterinburg, we stayed in a hotel, an outstandingly luxurious hotel. Um, which, and that was the view from our bedroom window. Um, and I didn't know about this. I didn't know where this actual cathedral was. And I was sort of admiring this immensely impressive building. And it was only when you actually get down to it, and it, it's much further away than it looks from here, that you realize that this is the cathedral built on the site of the Apatiev House. Um, and a monastery me, sprang up on the site of Ganina Yama, and this is a huge complex of monastic buildings, um, very beautiful buildings in the Russian monastic style. Um, and in 2000, the year 2000, the imperial family were declared to be saint martyrs, which is not exactly the same as being a saint, but it's very similar, um, and you see these portraits all over Russia of the royal family, the imperial family, uh, portrayed in a, in a sort of saintly way. Um, and some of you will have been, for instance, to the Cathedral of St. Peter and St. Paul in St. Petersburg, uh, where there are a whole line of royal tombs at the back of the cathedral, but there's such interest in the fate of the royal family that they've devoted a special chapel to Nicholas and his family. And uh, that's the most crowded part of the whole cathedral. Honestly, even to get your head as far as a door takes quite a lot of effort and pushing and shoving. Um, so everywhere you go today, the memory of the imperial family is being invoked. Um, and... Uh, we went to, as I said, Katerinburg in September, and they were making extensive preparations for the uh, commemoration and the, and the veneration of the Romanov centenary. And here's the cathedral at night, and on the right of the cathedral is what used to be the bishop's house in Katerinburg, which has now been converted into a museum of the execution. And here is a photograph of the ceremony at the mine, which takes place uh, on July the 18th every year uh, to celebrate or to commemorate the death of the Romanovs. <clears throat>
And uh, I mean, the Romanovs, I've, in a way, I mean, right-wing groups in Russia have sort of captured the uh, kind of reputation of the Romanovs. You may have read recently that right-wing Christian groups threatened to burn down cinemas, which showed a recent film about Nicholas II's affair with a ballet dancer. Now, this was an affair which took place four years before he was married and five years before he became Tsar, but they threatened to burn down the cinemas because, simply because this film portrays the Tsar as a normal human being. In other words, not somebody with a halo over his head. And uh, the archbishop, the Moscow archbishop, Bishop Tikhon, called the film a desecration of history, a desecration of our culture, although it was actually very faithfully based on fact. And I don't believe that there is an appetite for a monarchist restoration, but uh, certainly the uh, wheel has, gone, has come full circle and the Romanovs are no longer regarded as the worst demons in Russian history. Now, I thought I should just end on two slightly lighter notes, and that is that there, it's not universally known that there was one survivor from the shootings in Ekaterinburg. Do you know who that was? Anastasia. Not Anastasia, <laughs> but I will mention the Anastasia story because it's one of the best known mysteries of the 20th century. And it's one of the most bizarre stories you know, in the whole of 20th century history. Basically, in 1920, a young woman was fished out of a canal in Berlin, suffering from obvious psychiatric disorders. She was put into a sort of infirmary. She had no papers, and she said virtually nothing she was taken to a mental hospital, and after about one or two years, other inmates eventually identify her as a daughter of the Tsars. In other words, she's not claiming in a sort of um, bombastic way to be a daughter of the Tsars. Other people are making the claim for her. And uh, eventually they call in several people who had known the imperial family, and many of these said, yes, this was definitely Anastasia. And here is Anastasia on the left, and the imposter, who became known as Anna, on the right. Um, here's another photograph of the two of them. Um, and people who had known Anastasia, uh, some people were prepared to uh, verify that this was undoubtedly you know, Anastasia five years later. And uh, the net widened, and she was taken up and housed by friends and even some Romanov relatives. And from now on, she became known as Anna. And she had ongoing health problems and was in and out of hospitals and asylums for most of her life. But by 1930, the extraordinary thing was that she showed every sign of believing herself that she was Anastasia. And she certainly had a very detailed knowledge of life in the imperial household. And that was almost certainly the result of assiduous coaching she received from her supporters. And why these people are coaching her with these details is because they are hoping to lay claim to the enormous fortune deposited by the Romanovs in London banks. But actually, there was almost no money left in the Romanov account. They'd repatriated all that money during the war, when, of course, it was needed for much more urgent things. Um, however, the girl's backers took her case to be recognized, and as Astasia, to the German courts, which is where all this was being played out, and they only decided against her in 1970. Uh, and by then, she'd moved to the USA, where she married a history professor who was one of history's all-time nutcases. <laughs> and she died 14 years later 
at the age of 88. And by then, most people believed that she was actually a Polish factory worker named Franziska Skanskowska. But uh, this had not been proved until the DNA tests you know, became sort of widely available. And when the DNA tests became available, then she, of course, by then had died, but her son was still alive. So they compared her son's DNA with the DNA of the other Romanov family members and with Prince Philip's DNA and so on, and discovered a zero correspondence. So this is a bit sad in a way, because it's a wonderful thing to think that possibly it could have been true. Anyway, but now we have to accept the fact that it wasn't true uh, and that there wasn't a shred of truth in it. But the story is a wonderful illustration uh, of the fact that people believe what they want to believe. And to me, the most amazing thing about this whole masquerade is that this girl, Anna, could not speak a single word of Russian. <laughs> and yet, you know, there were dozens of people who were prepared to believe that this was the lost princess, Anastasia. And uh, the exp the, the, her backers explained the fact that she couldn't speak any Russian by... Um, saying that something related to her traumatic, something so closely related to the traumatic experience she'd been through as the Russian language had been totally sublimated from her consciousness, you know, by this experience. And instead, she could speak German, you know, which she'd never <laughs> spoken before. It just doesn't make sense. And what about all the obvious discrepancies in her stories? I mean, for instance, she knew lots of things, a lot of things about uh, life in the Romanov palaces, but there were also mysterious things that she didn't know. Well, how do you explain those? Well, that was apparently, according to her backers, because she had lost the power of accurate narration. Um, so people are bending over backwards to explain the extraordinary sort of discrepancies in the case of this woman, but um, I mean, even the Tsar's mother at one stage you know, was prepared to accept the possibility that this might have been her granddaughter. Um, but so it wasn't Anastasia who was the survivor of this shooting. Do you know who it was? It was. No, not the doctor. The doctor died. Here's Anna, incidentally. Um, in, uh, in, the United, in, in retirement in the United States. But, uh, I mean, she was, you know, she had quite a lot of, uh, you know, mental problems, and one of them was that she loved cats, 60 of them. <laughs> um, God, have I put off half the audience? Sorry. Uh, and, uh, in fact, at one stage, one of, uh, an important member of a, of a, European royal family had given her a sort of mini palace to live in and then eventually he got tired of her and uh, ordered that she be that that this palace be cleared out uh, and in order to clear it out they had to get rid of her 16 greyhounds and her 60 cats anyway this is the only survivor of the shootings in Ekaterinburg this is joy uh, the Tsarovich's pet spaniel, well known to Russians because they'd been so frequently photographed together. Uh, and here's another of the photographs. And these photographs had been published all over Russia, and Joy was as well known to the Russian people as the Romanov children were. And in the chaos of the shooting, Joy somehow escaped and was taken home eventually by one of the Red Guards. And then, nine days later, as I said earlier, the city was recaptured by white armies and an officer serving with the British Expeditionary Force recognized the Spaniel and he took it back home with him to Windsor, where he lived. And that was where it lived out its remaining years. And when it died, he erected a little gravestone to it.
um, which you can still see in Windsor. And uh, um, that gravestone um, at one stage was threatened by being built over by a car park, but it was rescued. Uh, and I'm so, rather sorry that somehow this wasn't mentioned during Harry and Meghan's wedding, <laughs> you know, that they were passing the site of the death of the last Romanov. Um, anyway, uh, that is the only, uh, the only survivor and just about the only light note to come out of what is otherwise a very uh, harrowing and depressing story. So that's my bit finished. Anyone who has any questions, please ask. Yes. Well, they certainly would have been shot. No, no question of that. Um, I mean, everything that happened to all the other victims of Bolshevik suggests they would have, they'd have had been shown no mercy. Um, and Trotsky wanted to do that. Um, yes, I think it would have been exactly the same, but in a better, in a less messy and brutal way. So um, you mentioned at the beginning the hemophilia. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Can you tell us a little bit about the link of the whole royal, what's called the royal disease? Well, uh, yeah. well, we don't know anyone before Queen Victoria who was hemophiliac, so we think that the condition must have originated with her. And she had, of course, as you say, women are the carriers, but only men suffer from it. And uh, she had four sons, of whom only one was a hemophiliac. But two of her daughters were carriers, and they passed it on to their children. Um, and, uh, of course, that was a very serious, almost like an early sentence of death at the beginning of the 20th century. But now, of course, they can control hemophilia. And uh, I don't know whether it still survives in the royal family at all, but it isn't a sentence of death any longer. Well, Alexandria was the daughter of Queen Victoria's daughter. Okay. Yeah, she was the daughter of her daughter, Alex. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm of white Russian extraction, by the way. My father lived in 19. But one thing which seemed to be glossed over in the controversy about whether it was Lloyd George or George V who beat her a rescue of the imperial family. Yeah. Well, you know, the Tsar... But he's also on record as having said, you know, he'd like to go to Finland, he'd like to go to Crimea, he'd like to go somewhere. I mean, he, uh, he, he made many statements about where he might possibly hope to bend. Um, but whose responsibility it was for vetoing that, that's never been made clear either. Uh, yeah. What was the? The whole language of which they speak uh, English or German or Russian? No, they spoke Russian to each other, but Nicholas and Alexandra um, had actually uh, met um, at a wedding in Darmstadt about four years before they were married. And uh, when, of course, Nicholas, when Alexandra could not yet speak Russian, and they corresponded to each other all their lives in English. And all their letters, uh, which they wrote to each other, sometimes uh, thousands of them, are all in English. And everyone comments on the fact that Nicholas, who learnt English as a school subject, his English is very good, whereas Alexandra's English, and she'd grown up sort of half at her grandmother's court, so it was more or less like a home language, her English is hopeless, you know. She gets all the idiomatic sentences wrong and the um, pro, you know, subjects and predicates wrong and so on. 
uh, but they would have spoken Russian to each other at court. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Oh no, he was. Queen Prince Philip is a Prince Philip is a grandson of Queen Victoria's. Yeah. No. No, no. Very, very close relation. Well, partly because um, the fact that they weren't in the mine shaft, it seemed, you know, if they weren't there, where else could they be? Well, anyone who's been to Russia will know that the possibilities are absolutely infinite, and no one suspected that they would be so close to the mine shaft if they were not actually in the mine shaft. Um, it was pure luck that they came across them anyway. Um, they weren't looking for them in the sort of systematic way. He was also captured by the Bolsheviks and he was also executed. Um, and in more or less, well, in, within the same week. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, who else? Somebody? Oh, thank you, sorry. Well, I personally think he was very ineffective, and everything I've read you know, confirms that opinion. But if you talk to people like Bishop Tikon today, you know, he says, oh, he's much maligned, he was you know, brilliant, sympathetic, incisive, you know, sort of. Uh, I mean, the people who are trying to pretend now that he was a saint, you know, are equally prepared to pretend that he was a masterful, decisive, you know, ruler of Russia. Yeah. Yes, he was. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not writing him off at all. He did. He did lots of it, but he certainly wasn't a saint. He, funny enough, he had one of his sort of uh, bees in his bonnet, he had an absolute phobia about Jews. Um, and he was one of the most anti-Semitic people I've ever read about. Um, and uh, whether this is okay for a saint, I'm not sure. Um, but, uh, you know, he, wa he wasn't a saint uh, in the normal sense of the word at all. Yurovsky. Yurovsky, well, Yurovsky survived, um, and uh, eventually he became a sort of um, uh, a local official in the Ekaterinburg Soviet, and he actually died in about 1934. Um, but as far as I know, he died in bed, you know, which was a rare thing for people involved in Russian politics. <laughs> yeah. Well, the Danish court, of course, Alexandra, uh, um, sorry, um, Alexandra, Nicholas's mother was Princess Dagmar, and she actually went back to Denmark after being rescued from the Crimea in 1920. Um, and she made sort of representations to, uh, but by then, of course, the family were already dead, but she didn't know that when she left Russia. Uh, and the Danish court um, didn't quite know how to react to these deaths, uh, but uh, they, didn't, they don't make a great sort of public declaration of support for them. Well, yeah, last one. Oh, okay, last two, yeah. Yes. Yes. I, I didn't think he was. Um, 
but you know, I I wouldn't necessarily know that. No, interesting point. Sorry, the other one. <laughs> Beg your pardon. Ah, that they all the possessions that they had, you know, were taken away from them and put into uh, safe keeping. And uh, I mean, some of them were no, no some of them were too. Uh, for instance, um, when they were led down to the cellars, they didn't take everything with them, and that may have been not taken down from their from their living quarters in the first place. Uh, it's a good question, and I don't know the answer. <laughs> right, the diaries, yeah. Yeah, that was what I was being asked. How did the diaries survive? And I can either they were not taken down to the cellar or they survived all the chaos and the... Okay, last one. Yes, sir. Well, the, basically, the, the Russian Orthodox Church, I would say, is the moving spirit behind all this. And, uh, well, it wasn't initially, but Putin, you know, when he came back after his spell as being a prime minister, do you remember that? Um, in 2008, uh, sorry, 2012, um, when he came back for his second spell as a president, he then became a returned as a very devout Christian. And he now, he now has a very strong alliance with the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, he doesn't actually, and he, I mean, he certainly gives sympathetic consideration to their claims without actually, without actually giving it state support. But you don't need to give it state support because everywhere in Russia, anything that the Ro Russian Orthodox Church is promoting is lavishly supported by the Russian public. Um, and, I mean, when you see how beautifully the Russian churches have been decorated and how beautifully they've been restored so soon after, you know, the collapse of communism, you realize there's massive public support for it. Okay, well, I think everybody needs to get off. Thank you very much indeed for that. That was, and all the all the points came up beautifully. Hello, hi. Um, I'm a friend of uh, Paul Rowe, who you. Oh, there you are. Anyway, hey, yeah. uh, just quickly. Sorry. Oh yes, that's fine.